Sonic, the heart of your system. What's up guys, welcome back to another GGF mod build video and today I'll be going over the two builds I recently did in the Lanley 011 Evo. Now I've gone through a lot of the YouTube comments on the two build and I've done a bit of a, um, a sketch down on some of the questions you've asked and I'll hopefully answer those uh, for you in this video. Now I don't want to make it too long so I've gone through the main comments, things like uh, the upright GPU, I didn't cover some things like running items behind. So say in this setup here, can I run a reservoir behind? Can I run fans behind? Say if you're running a 1390, ideally running some fans behind blowing straight onto the back would be a pretty neat option. Uh, some other things are the performance of running this 600 mm Thermaltake riser cable. A lot of you have may notice nearly all the builds out there run the stock cable that runs over the top of all your hardware and into the first slot. So I've done some testing uh, in my 8x slot, which is Gen 4, and running the 600mm riser cable. Uh, some other things I want to talk about, how to bend this copper tubing, uh, bending it like this, bending it like this, how the clear coat has lasted. I think it's been, what, uh, December 17, I think, launch was. It's been about two months. So I can go through uh, some of the raw copper that I've just had in the garage for my leftovers, and then I can go over the copper that I've got in these two builds that was clear coated, and then things like these little side skirts and the back copper cover. So first off, I wanna jump in. I want to cover, not so much ass on this, but I wanna get this out of the way that you cannot run a 280 millimeter radiator up the top. So 140 mil spec, uh, whether it's a, probably 140, you could at the very end if you are running the upright GPU in this bracket, because the bracket up the top that goes in, I'll get some closer shots on this, the bracket is basically touching this 360 millimeter radiator, so that uses the 120 millimeter standard. So moving on to the 140 millimeter standard, it definitely will not fit. So that's what I wanted to get out of the way, but most of you, if you're doing a build like this, I'll go with the 360 mil radiator anyway. Now, another question that was asked a few times, the max GPU width. Now, as you can see in this build, I'm using the heat killer. This is the RX 68 6900 XT water block, and these reference cards aren't very wide. So as I mean uh, width, I mean from the bus to the top of the card, which is this way. So I've got a bit of room here. So I measured this with the GPU in its backmost slot because the bracket up the top can cater for uh, three slot cards. If you're not using a three slot card, if you're using a two slot, you can then move it forward one or back one in its back position. Uh, you've got 152 millimeters of width before it hits the uh, a bit of the brackets of the case in here. And then if you move it to the other slot, which is uh, towards the front of the case a bit more, you then have 160 millimeters of clearance because the terminal can go a little bit into this uh, front section here before it hits the glass. So you get a little bit more. But in saying that, if you do run your GPU in the forward mode slot, that's moving it more towards the main section. It will have an issue running the riser cable into the cable grommet because the cable grommet is perfectly in line with the GPU in its uh, back slot. So moving it forward, you really need to put a bend on that riser cable. And also something to take note of running the fittings in the back. If you do have a very wide card, say up to the 160, you may have to run both your in and your out from the front because running it in the back, there's a bit of the case, um, how it's made, it will bulk out the frame and it is covering those ports. So ideally, you do want a GPU that is not so wide. Now, running items behind the GPU in this uh, vertical upright position. Uh, this might be a bit complicated, but I'll run through it. Um, if you're familiar with my review, I did mention running the radiator bracket in its uh, forward position, and then it can also run in its back position. So I'll cover that shortly, but if you're not wanting to run the back radiator bracket at all, which I have done here, I'm not running it at all because I didn't need to, I got nothing behind. So say you want to run an active black back plate, you can, there is plenty of room. There's about 65 millimeters from the back of the GPU to the back of the side panel. So if you want to run, say, an EK active back plate on your 3090, you can do that as so. You don't need the radiator bracket installed. Now using the side radiator bracket, I do suggest having the GPU in its forward most position. In this build, I've got it in the back most position because I don't have anything installed in the back. So having the GPU in its forward most slot, this gives you about 40 millimeters in the main chamber and then you get about 45 millimeters in the back chamber and that's with the radiator bracket in its forward most position. So that would be ideal for something like an FLT because they're about 30, 35 millimeters thick and then that would allow you to have the DDC in the back because you do have that uh, 45 millimeters of uh, width in the back. Now with the radiator bracket in its back position, and this is back one, so this means you can't put anything in the back chamber. It's giving you the bulk of the space 
behind the GPU. This gives you a total of 80 millimeters behind the GPU. And this will vary slightly depending on which uh, GPU backplate you have. Some other brands are thicker and some are thinner. So these options are best with FLTs. Uh, in the second one, it's not so good for an F, uh, FLT because you've just got the bulk 80 mil. I would suggest the first option, which has the radiator bracket in the middle. So that means you can put the res on the main chamber and then that can allow for the pump to go in the back chamber. And also for the 3090, you can put fans in there as well. Now, performance with the uh, Thermaltake 600mm riser. Yes, I did run it in the 8x Gen 4. I wanted to do that because I think running the cable up one in the first slot would really ruin the look of this build. It's a very clean build, minimum cables can be seen. So I decided to run it in the Gen 4 P38 by which is more than enough for a 6900 XT. If, if you're doing some extreme overclocking, you want to break some records, uh, one, you wouldn't be running it on a riser cable, and two, you'll definitely want it in the utmost slots. But hey, we're not doing that. Uh, we're just doing a clean looking build. But in saying that, I'm not going to do a build that doesn't work. And also, they're going to perform the best they can. Now, going through some of the results, I have been gaming on this and I haven't noticed any issues. Normally, when you run a dodgy dodgy riser cable. Uh, back in the day, I would say probably three to four years ago when the first Gen 3 riser cables were coming out, the real flimsy ones that had that tape over all the contacts. Basically, you bent them a few times and you would lose signal, you would crash and all that. So basically, the Gen 4 ones now, they're really good quality. They have plastic all over the connectors and they work much better. I don't think I've had a Gen 4 riser cable fail at all. Now, looking at some of the test results, so taking a look at our first results here, this is 3D Mark Time Spy. Uh, everything in this system is stock. It's running a 6900 XT and the 12700K. There's no point tweaking it because I just want to give you what this system will do completely stock. So our score was 20,286. As you can see, that is bang on what the average score is for this system. Now what we want to look at is the graphics score and it was 20,955. Now if there were going to be some performance issues, first off, you'd probably have crashing, uh, you'd probably have screen flickering, you'd probably have random issues like that. And the fact that our score is pretty much dead on what the average is, it's showing us that it's going to be pretty good. Now moving on to our Time Spy Extreme, I wanted to do some, something a little bit higher res, something that would struggle a little bit better. And the average again, once again, we are above the average. Now looking at the graphics score, we've got 10,287. And then last off was the super position I ran the 4K optimized and we got a score of 16,340. And the FPS minimum was 75, average was 122, and the max was 151. Now that's pretty much bang on what you would expect for this system. So I have no doubts that this uh, K, riser cable is performing as it should. Now in saying that, I said that earlier, you're not gonna be breaking any records or going crazy with a system like this, especially in the second slot and with this uh, riser cable. When you are gonna break records, you're throwing it on a test bench and you're gonna be running the first slot and you want the minimal length you want. Now there is someone who did do a Reddit post. Um, no doubt, I'm pretty sure they did see this video. They went out and purchased the thermal take uh, riser cable. They're running it behind. I'll throw the link up. They've got a really sick setup of this uh, white O11 Evo. Uh, with that cable running behind and they have been saying they've running, been running Destiny, they've had no issues at all and they've got some results and some benchmarks and there's quite a few comments in that thread so I'll throw that in the description below and you guys can check that out and if you've got any questions you can join in on that and respond. Now another thing I want to cover is how to bend the copper and what type of copper tubing. Now I'm in Australia here, all that copper here is imperial, so it's half inch. Now that makes it very, very hard to find hard tube fittings for this. I had to source some in the US, so they are, are the monsoon. So half inch uh, monsoon fittings, that represents about 12.7 millimeters uh, in the metric system. And the fittings for the monsoon, they're not bad because they come with different O-rings on the inside, so they can do quite a few sizes. If you go next up, you just change the O-ring on the inside and that allows you for slightly thicker and slightly thinner uh, tubing. Now, in terms of the tubing I use, first off, I sourced some tubing from my local hardware store, which is Bunnings. I'll put links to all these in below, but I found that tubing was very rough. Uh, this is it here. It actually had the writing stamped into it, so I could not sand it out. It also looked like it had a seam all the way along, which I could not sand out. So that was gonna be a big issue because I didn't want to have uh, writing stamped in and seams along the tubing. So I went to a plumbing supply, we have Reese in Australia, that's what it's called. I went to their refrigeration uh, line of gear and this is refrigeration copper and I found this was much cleaner. It basically nearly came like this, it came shiny. Uh, the writing was inked on so that meant it could sand off and to get it to a nice shiny finish, I started with about 600 grit 
I went to 1200 grit, I went to about 2000, and then about 2500 I finished, and then I used some metal polish to finish it all off. But I couldn't just leave it at that, because as you can see, some of these ones here, so this is a bit of tube I finished. I'll get some close-ups on this. Now this, once you get your fingerprints and your, your oils on it, it will start to oxidize really, really bad. So this has been in the garage for about, well, it gets to a point and then it stopped. Um, it does, takes about a week for it to go like this. And this is something I really didn't want to happen in my build. Like, yes, you could probably just run some brass over it. If you got lines like this, if these started to patina or oxidize, yes, you could just run some brass. So some metal polish would clean it up pretty quickly and it would be looking shiny and good to go. But in a build like this where the bends are a bit harder to reach, you don't really want that. So I clear coated, I just used a generic clear coat. Um, they probably all work the same. I tried a few, they all did look the same. So this is a matte finish. So funnily enough, this tubing was 100% uh, shiny, super polished like this, and the clear coat, it gave it this real matte look. Now I could have gone with a gloss clear coat, but I decided to go with a matte uh, instead. Now moving on how to bend with the white 11 Evo, I simply just got my spare car tire, put it up against like a pole or a desk leg, wedged this in between the car tire and just slightly bent around. I didn't need an insert, I didn't need any at all. It was a very uh, large curve, so it wasn't going to bend or kink. And that's how I did that. Once I got a big curve, I then just cut it into segments and that was it. If you're looking at how to cut it, this is a standard uh, PETG uh, tube cutter. You just simply put it in. I'll do one on here to show you, very simple. You don't need any fancy tools. So if you are doing water cooling and you want to step up to this level, you may find that you may already have one of these cutters. And I'll just put the volume down for that because that was quite loud. And that's how you cut it, just like that. Now, if you're using compression fittings or even pushing fittings where there's an O-ring on the inside, which you most have, you will have to file this. You can get an electric one, electric file that goes on the drill just to deburr it, but I just use a hand file and you really need that nice and smooth because if that cuts your o-ring it will then link uh, leak in your system now moving on to some of the more uh complex bends like the 90s and if you're doing double 90s i didn't need to do any in these builds but you can do them now this is the bender i used on the copper black build here you can see it gave some pretty nice 90s i since then have bought a more expensive one this is about 60 dollars australian this one is about 180 australian i think this one here gives you a slightly slightly sharper 90 and this gives you removable parts like this uh this guide here can be replaced uh and so on you can do a few little tweaks to it now when it comes to these i would suggest reading the manual that's what i did just to make sure i was doing it right you just got to make sure once you insert the tube like so uh, you do have to line it up to the zero. You make sure the two zeros are lined up. You don't want to start it halfway like this or so on. You need to make sure the 90 is lined up and then you have this. It's actually quite hard to do it like this on a table. So like that. So now you can see the two zeros are completely lined up. They're all the way in their back position and now you can start. Now, one thing you have to make sure of, you don't want to be moving it around in this guide because you will scratch it. So what I did, I actually sanded all, all my length of tubes first, polished them up, and then any imperfections I got when bending them, I just fixed it up later on because it's much easier to stick like a bit, a straight bit in the drill. You can get it spinning to sand it that way than have to manually sand uh, a bit that's got a few bends in it. Now to bend this tubing, I'm gonna do it quite fast, but um, first of all, you do need to put this locking thing down because then it won't work. Um, like this, I will do it fast on film. That's if I can e even do it. I still am recovering from this hand, but um, you need to go really slow. I'll see if I have a bit here. If you went a little bit fast, it started to kink on the inside. Now, if you're not gonna see the inside, that's fine. But if you went a fraction too fast, you just have to play around with it. It will kink and it does take quite a bit of force to bend it just to start it. I do normally just push it against myself. And then once you get your 90 like so, I would go onto like a corner of a table and I would just line it or hover it over to make sure it was a perfect 90. So I can undo that now. Now you don't need any inserts, you don't need anything. I tried sand, I tried um, rubber inserts and I found they made no, no difference. The issue with putting sand in it and doing a bend was trying to get the sand out was a big pain. So that's the bend there. That actually turned out pretty good. That didn't kink on the inside and I went pretty fast. And as you can see, there's like very, very minimal uh, 
imperfections on the on the ends after the bend. I found that with this build, there are a few little imperfections when it starts and when it uh, finishes, but this one actually came out really good. So that might be the difference between the slightly more expensive one and the cheaper bender. Now, one thing you wanna make sure of, you don't want to nick or scratch the inside where this runs around or in here. I actually put some Vaseline in here to help it uh, grip and if there was any dirt, it would probably slide along with it because I didn't want to get any scratches in there. So that's basically it on how to bend it. Not too hard, I'll suggest play around. And it's pretty inexpensive. Like a massive six meter length of this, this is a better refrigeration tubing. I think it was about $80 Australian for six, uh, six meters. Now bear in mind, I did use all the six meters for these three bends because I wanted the per most perfect ones I could get because I guess I'm a bit of a perfectionist. I wanted the best ones I could for that. So I used the whole six meters. But for you, you can just go and experiment, see how it goes and go from there. And the clear coat, I think you 100% need to do it. The only downside side with the clear coat is once you say spray your, fit uh, spray your tubing, you've got it all ready and you put your locking collar down on the fitting. If you're not perfectly straight, it will do a few little scratches in the clear coat and then you will get a shiny bit underneath because I've got a matte clear coat, it will be shiny. And that was a bit of, a bit of an issue because with these curved ones, they were getting scratches. So in the end, what I ended up doing was putting the run in before I clear coated it, undid the fittings at the base, so say here, and I undid it there, taped off the fitting and then clear coated it. So when I was installing the tubing, I installed it as one whole piece, so I didn't have to put the collars on, they were already on, I would just twist it at the rotary at each end and that's how I got around it from scratching the, uh, the tubing. I have actually looked into getting some metric uh, copper tubing. I found some on AliExpress. I've got 12 mil and 14 mil coming. So the reason why I've looked into that is I can use them with uh, standard pushing fittings. So things like EK, bits power pushing fittings. Then I don't have to worry about a collar because the clear coat was very, very strong. Once it's on and you get your fingers on it, it is strong. It won't affect the tubing. It's once you get a little scratch on it, that's when it rips it straight off. So having pushing fittings, no collar, it'll push straight in and that should be much better. And being metric, it'll just be much more universal with a lot of fittings and it should look much better. So I'll definitely be doing a build with the 12 mil or 14 mil when that arrives. So that's basically it on the tubing. Last thing I do want to cover are the copper panels for this. I wasn't quite sure how well this was gonna turn out, but first off when I was doing this build, I thought this one looked really amazing. But then when this build finished, I kind of changed my opinion that this one just looks so much better than the white one, just the black and the copper. A lot of people did say black and gold. Um, you guys might need to get your eyes checked, but yeah, it's 100% copper. Kind of a rose gold looking color, but yeah, it is copper. So the side panels here and here, they're like the previous builds I did, the Lanley uh, 011 Air Mini where I covered the uh, panels. These ones are a bit different. These are actually copper sheets I got off a friend. They've just been cut down to size and I will put the measurements of these up in the description. I don't have them on me now. And they are just double-sided taped in the frame. This one up top here does have a fill piece, so it is attached directly to the radiator. It's got a bit of a square block of aluminum that runs along, and that's just got some heavy-duty uh, double-sided tape holding that on. So these were all cut to size. They were sanded the same as these, uh, 600, 1200, 2000, 3000 grit. Then they were polished, it takes a lot longer to polish a much larger area, especially this back area. It takes, the service area is so much larger. And I'm just doing these by standard drills and by hand. So it does take a lot longer. And then once they were done, I then just did clear coat this, clear coat this, and clear coat the back. The back I just left completely as is, I didn't cover. And I wanted that nice contrast between the black and then the copper on the back. And then for the front, I just vinyl wrapped it. I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do, but I think having, leaving it all copper, which I was going to do at first, would have been too much. It would have taken away the nice contrast of the tubing. So I decided to cover most of the copper with just black uh, vinyl wrap. And then the bottom one, I just put the heat killer logo because I did cover both of their logos on their radiators. So I thought I'll throw some support back to them and throw their logo on the bottom one. But yeah, that's pretty much it on this video. Um, I don't know how long it's gone. Uh, hopefully it's not too long. But yeah, any other questions you have on these builds, throw them in the YouTube comments and I'll be sure to check them out and hopefully answer them for you. But anyway, I wanna thank Lanley for sending these two cases out to check out and also Bits Power and Heat Killer for sponsoring these builds. I'll see you in the next one.